Okay, I think we're gonna get started. So um, welcome to the third morning of the fest. It's almost over, unfortunately. I'm sort of sad. <laughs> um, can you hear me okay now? Yes. So um, the topic of the session that we defined is um, collaborative governance, distributed leadership. Marianne and I actually had a hard time agreeing what to call it because we realized there's many different terms that are used self-organization, self-management, uh, horizontal governance. There seems to be a large diversity. But so we have some really interesting people here that all have experience with uh, these subjects. But our idea was to really organize the session in a collaborative fashion and try to apply some of the principles that we've used in our daily routines in organizing ourselves to the session itself. So uh, Marianne is gonna really briefly explain the rules of the session and then we can get going. Thanks. So, <clears throat> as I just said, as we just said several times, we really expect you to be uh, participating in this session, and we would like you to experiment this uh, collaborative governance by taking this role to uh, ask questions, to uh, share stories with us about your experience or your doubts or whatever you would like to us to discuss. Uh, you also have the opportunity to um, to talk. So you also are the speakers. So if you are going, Leticia, who is there, is going to go uh, in the room and give you post-its. You can add post-its anytime during the session. And you can also request a micro to, to tell a story or to ask questions. So don't hesitate to participate. This is really the point. Um, just after, shortly, uh, the, the speakers here who are, are going to share the, the, their experience, so they're going to present themselves and to tell us uh, what biggest challenge they have with governance. But before that, I would like to do something that we, uh, in my organization, which is called Estrelab, we also are using this, this type of organization, uh, collaborative governance. We always start our sessions, our meetings, by a check-in. So what is a check-in? Basically, it's just saying how we feel uh, it's just changing from a sp it's just uh, the transition from a space to another. So now we're going to enter the space of um, of this uh, this uh, session, and I would like all of us here on the stage to tell to say how we feel right now. So I can start. I'm actually really happy to be here. Um, I ha I'm a bit anxious that uh, you are going to learn something and that you can really that you are really are going to participate. And I, but I trust that it's going to be cool. Um, I'm also really happy. Uh, I'm uh, happy and tired and uh, excited that the event has been a success so far, I think, and great to see uh, so many people that are interested in the subject. So I'm actually just uh, curious for the rest of the day. Hello, everyone. So I'm not going to present myself yet. Um, I'm a bit tired, too. Uh, but I'm really happy to hear all the answers you're going to have to my challenges. Hi, everybody. Um, I would say I'm curious, just that. And I'm always happy to challenge my ideas and com uh, have a dialogue on that with people. So I'm curious what's coming out of this specific crowd in front of us, which is uh, of a special kind, you know, uh, different from management events or that kind of stuff. So I'm really curious. Thank you. Um, well, I have some hangover thanks to Trade Day, and I'm excited thanks to the girls organizing this session. So I'm looking forward. Awesome. So um, Marianne and I are now going to go check out the post-its and start organizing the questions. And in the meantime, we're going to ask um, the three of you to all introduce yourself, um, say something about what's specific to the organization that you're working in, and what your current biggest challenge is in regards to your governance structure. And um, after that, Marianne and I will do the same, and then we'll start launching into the questions and um, let anyone also, if you would like to add your own answers to the questions, um, feel free to do so. Hello, everyone. So I'm Leila. I'm the co-founder of Make Sense. So I'm going to first describe the, the organization and then tell you about the challenges we're facing right now. So Make Sense started five years ago. Our goal is to give everyone the tools to help the social entrepreneurs in the city they would like to help. So it's a community of volunteers all over the world 
using open source methodologies that they have also created themselves and that they use and hack and improve to uh, identify social entrepreneurs that are inspiring or they want to help, to use the right methodologies to go from a challenge to a concrete solution, and to engage people around them, would it be citizens, but also other actors and players in the society. So it's really how we organize this collective action. And so for the last five years, there's more than 20,000 people that have participated to help more than 1,000 social entrepreneurs all over the world in the five continents. And so um, to do that, we have a coordinating team. We have community developers in different regions of the world. Uh, we have a team that um, checks, that, that delivers, provides the platform to do so, to make sure that we spread the tools, that we ensure that the mission is respected, and to make sure that we really move forward with great projects and empower all the members of the community. And um, another thing that is important that I should tell you to understand our governance model is also that um, to ensure the business model of it, so here there's no money involved. And some of the members of Make Sense decided that they wanted to do that full time and that there were some activities that could be created on top of what Make Sense was doing to increase the impact, to bring more uh, professional tools and to engage different players. So some of these entrepreneurs, so members of the community who became entrepreneurs, have created different business branches, activities, who contribute to the mission, but with a different way. And so they contribute in generating revenues. And we have created different entities that have a link with the association, because they all give 10% to their turnover to the association, to make sense, to make sure that we cover the operational cost, to um, help support the community activities. So we, when we started, we didn't have this governance thing in mind, to be honest. Um, it was really, how do we make sure we provide the tools? And the, the rule was, uh, this is the mission, you have the tools, play with it. And make sure there's hap things happening everywhere. And um, why this governance topic came along the way? Because we needed to be very transparent between the links with the business activities and the non-business activities. And also because we have different players. We have some volunteers that come one time when they want. We have long-term volunteers that would like to understand how they can contribute to the mission again and again. We have the businesses and we have the full-time team. So our challenge is, is really to understand for these four different actors, what is their role? What is their contribution to the decisions we need to make? So the right and duties of everyone. And it's also how do we make an inclusive model, but at the same time very effective and where we guarantee also the autonomy of the entrepreneurs that want to go fast and that want to have this autonomy to feel that they accomplish their mission within Make Sense. So these are my two challenges. All right, I'm Stelio Verzera, I'm from Italy. Um, I co-founded Cocoon Projects in uh, 2011 uh, on the crash of a previous company, just to be clear. So that's where we learned. I've, I've just heard uh, in, in Barcelona a few days ago that an expert is somebody that has, has done all the possible errors in a domain. So we're getting expert in that, in that respect. Actually, we have seen ourselves with a previous company and our customers doing over and over the same kind of errors. And since we were already working with lean thinking principles, we started to identify those errors as wastes. Uh, just to name a few, but you all know, uh, a fixed organizational structure has built-in bottlenecks in terms of decisions that are on specific nodes. You know, you know the marketing manager, for example, has to decide everything marketing. Um, also, that not just a kind of bottleneck, but probably even worse, um, competencies evolution bottlenecks. I challenge any marketing manager or uh, IT manager to be aware of what everything that is going on in her domain in one week in the world and take decision on that. And the list can go, co go on for long, like non-peer evaluation, uh, a few people that try to preserve privilege over the 
higher number of people in the company, a loss of knowledge waste because people that were not included, slowness in, adapt, in adapting. It's like, you know, with, we started to see an organizational chart like a, like a single photogram of a movie, like, like a frame. And we needed something that could change over time fluidly. So that's why we called it liquid organization, basically. We worked uh, like nine months, like a baby, to design our framework. Uh, we built on existing blocks, must from the lean, lean thinking and open collaboration uh, body of knowledge. And we designed this model for ourselves, uh, not for selling it. It's called Liquido. It's, if you're interested, I don't know if we have time, it's, but it's on liquidorganization.info. It's a, it's a framework that can be instantiated in different ways. We decided to be all in in that. So if you think about um, leanness, openness, and inclusiveness as dimensions, we, we decided to have it all the way. So for example, we don't have job titles. We don't do job interviews. Uh, anybody, can be, anybody knows anything going on about the governance in the company and can take part freely. So there are quite a few things that we decided to try. It's, it worked. And uh, just to cut it short, the biggest challenges we have now, I would say, are two. One is, as we are getting prepared to scale up, is to understand how the information flows can work in such an environment. Because when you have an organizational chart, you also design the communication lines. So you know where to ask or where to send your information. When you don't have that, it's a little more tricky and we're, think, we're, we're experimenting um, ways uh, to allow people to attract the information they need while they are acting. And that's not that easy. We'll probably take some advantage of new technologies for that. The other one is a more human, um, I would say, challenge that is uh, existing culture. We've been taught uh, at schools how things should work with one people speaking, the, all the other listening, people divided by the ears. So we have this uh, structured, hierarchical, uh, static mindset. And what happens is that even people <coughs> that enter our company really happy to be in such a diverse setting think in that way they don't know it, notice it. So that might happen, it may give rise of different uh, uh, behaviors. For example, there are people that don't act if somebody don't tell them what to do. And in our company, you can stand still as long as you want. Nobody is going to tell you what to do. And that's a problem because we are still on the market. So, you know, we would like not to waste that potential. On top of that, we don't do job interviews. So, if you choose two, three, five people per year, you can spend time to onboard them and to try to get them going while when people can freely enter, it's tricky. They freely enter, freely exit. We have that flow. And it might be really a waste of time in some respect to go through it with all of them. So these are the main challenges. I would say more an informational side and a cultural side, the biggest ones. Thank you. Hey, everyone. My name is Peter. I'm co-founder of lab.cope. Um, and our story also started with a company which we have crashed. It was a um, social media software startup. We have been venture capital bagged. Uh, we went through all the ups and downs of an early stage startup. And then uh, we failed to raise our third round of investment. And then with my partner, we uh, started to talk about uh, what's next. Should we uh, keep working together? We decided yes. And what kind of organization we would like to build. Uh, and our goal was to build uh, a software product agency, which is uh, something that we have learned in the last couple of years, how to build products. Um, and uh, we wanted to make an organization which is scalable. Uh, and that's why we decided to go um, towards a way uh, where governance is collaborative. We have implemented partly holacracy and partly an advisory process. Uh, so we kind of shaped these uh, methods to our face. And on the other hand, to be able to hire developers, which is not an easy thing today in Europe, because there are 900,000 open jobs in the European Union, uh, we decided to um, make this company uh, a co-owned company. 
uh, we were thinking about to do it as a cooperative, uh, but it wasn't flexible enough and we thought it won't be scalable in a way how we wanted to do it. So we became an employee-owned corporation. And basically we give away one share to everyone who works in full time after each month of employment. So kind of we reward the time um, people have invested into the company. And um, everyone has two kind of roles uh, in the sense that everyone is a shareholder and everyone is an employee, a full-time employee of the organization. And uh, our biggest challenge is quite similar because uh, we created this structure to, uh, to make a scalable organization, but this is the biggest risk too. Uh, how can we make sure that by hiring 20, 20, uh, 10, 20 people uh, in the next uh, six to eight months, uh, gonna, we're gonna be able to keep the culture? Uh, how can we make sure that, for example, the new hires uh, who become shareholders won't decide uh, not to give away shares in the future because they will have the right to it because they can elect a new uh, They can kind of vote for a new uh, constitution within the organization um, So these are the biggest problems which we have today uh, And I'm really excited to see other models how they work and try to learn together about it Thank you <coughs> so uh, apart of, uh, apart being a uh, WeShare connector in Nice, in France, I'm, I'm also the founder of a company which is called Estrelab. Uh, we are work, as I said just before, we are using collaborative governance for a company. We're very small, we're three. And we help companies shift from uh, business models to go towards sustainable business models. And we also help them to shift to a more collaborative companies and more open companies. Um, uh, I would uh, I'll say that um, our biggest challenge was at the beginning to structure and to change mindset. I think it's really important to change the view of an, an organization as not being fixed, I think as you said, but also as being something that is alive. So you use the word liquid and we see it more like something that is living, like an animal or like uh, something natural. And the, the biggest challenge now is, as Frédéric Lalou said yesterday, I don't know if you were at his uh, conference, but it's really to sense and respond, to observe and to be able to uh, guide, to work for the company and to respect it, its own rhythm. At the beginning, the, the difficulty was to try to go very, very fast, but an organization has its own rhythm and you have to respect its own pace. So we had to be patient. I had to learn patience, which was not my, my best uh, quality. And now it's to continue to observe it, to respond, and to take actions that really are corresponding to the, to the rhythm, and to scale step by step. So um, I'm Francesca from WeShare. So that's actually my main activity uh, for quite a while. And as I guess many of you know, uh, we're quite a large community that's distributed all over the world. And quite similar to some of the challenges from Make Sense, we also have very many different levels of contributions. So people that have full-time jobs that are just contributing as volunteers, others that are really doing it as their full-time activity. So uh, one of the main challenges that we have is finding ways to value and measure different contributions, um, how to distribute that value, and also just uh, show recognition in different ways because uh, due to these different types of involvement, people also want different ways of being recognized. So some are more interested in monetary rewards, others just want love, <laughs> for instance. So um, there's a lot of um, like adaptation needed. Um, and so another, another challenge that we've ran into is basically over the past three years, we've created a lot of structures. Um, We've always waited till we really felt they were needed because we really didn't want to create too much too quickly. Um, we were always trying to just respond to sort of informal structures that emerged and then formalizing them. But so something we've noticed that there's often a tension between formal and informal structure and being able to figure out how to make those actually overlap. Because um, often if you say, no, we're not gonna structure at all, it's just gonna be, you know, emerge and be void then things emerge and if they're not expressed and they're just informal, then that can create a 
difficulties, and it's important to, to actually formalize more things and document them and really express how they are. So that in brief, um, I think that gives a good uh, overview of the different uh, structures and situations we're in. We have some really good questions we already saw, so Marianne is going to read out some of them, and then we'll just uh, throw them into the round. And basically, if you um, feel you have a good answer to one of the questions as well, then um, just feel free to raise your hand, and then um, Leticia will come with the microphone, and you can stand up and answer as well. So I'm going to start with uh, this first question. I think it's, um, it's nice. What kind of self-managed organization already exists? So maybe you have examples um, outside of yours, or maybe you can use yours uh, to describe it. Well, um, I don't want to talk about mine again, uh, but um, we have been looking at different examples uh, in the software industry uh, when we kicked off, uh, and we truly appreciated, for example, how Valve uh, figured out a system of, of collaborative governance and how they empowered uh, their employees. That's uh, one of the, the leading organizations, in, in my understanding, in this in the software industry. Or it's really uh, interesting how Zappos and others started to implement holacracy and why they uh, have had challenges with it. Uh, so these are the kind of organizations which we were looking at. Um, one example for me that I've been following and inspiring me a lot is Officience. And so two of the team are here are working hard on this. So can you raise your hand so they can come talk to you after? Um, so one great example is actually in Spiral. Um, we actually spoke to them for very long. We wanted them to come to the fest this year, but it didn't work because they're all the way in New Zealand. But so in Spiral is actually a network of entrepreneurs, and so it's a network of several companies that are all connected to the Inspiral Foundation. And they have a really, really interesting governance model that we've been, I mean, we've been discussing with them and trying to figure out how we can sort of learn from each other um, because they have a some very interesting decision-making processes in terms of budgeting. So each entrepreneur with their company, they contribute a specific amount of money or value to a big uh, bucket, they call it. And then everyone um, in the network can basically vote based on how much they've contributed on how that gets distributed to fund new projects. Um, so that's one example. And what's also really great, some, some of you have maybe heard of Lumio. That's one of the uh, organizations in their network, and that's a collaborative decision-making tool that we're also using within WeShare. And for instance, um, Podemos in Spain, like they have 100 Lumio groups, um, and it's a really, really great tool for consensus-based decision-making um, because you don't really have to vote in many cases, but can just have a discussion and then come to an agreement that way, and it's really, really powerful uh, we started using it like six months ago, and I must say it really changed a lot for us and enabled many more people to get involved, and people that hadn't been that vocal in decision-making before suddenly sort of popped up and were voting and saying things, um, so that was really great. Um, hello, everybody. <laughs> Speak louder. Stand up. Sta okay. Um, this is just to, to, to tell you that um, I'm currently working in a software and a consulting company. And um, I'm responsible of what we call Vitality. And we are changing right now the, the organization now two years. We call it um, organic governance. And so if, uh, I, I, if you want me to share something about, should I, I'm sorry. It's not, uh, I should speak louder? No, just and stand so that okay. everyone can see you. Well, I don't know. There, there are many, many things to say. Uh, I heard a few questions, and uh, we experienced this. I think uh, the purpose of this is uh, that everybody can bring his power and so meet his power and find the place, the right place to, to bring it. And it's, this is a quite a, a hard task. Um, and... Uh, there is an important subject in this. It's the meeting. Uh, for us, it's quite complex because we are a consulting and, and uh, 
software company which is uh, making a, a business intelligence for big companies in the media industry. And we had uh, an IT director, we had a general uh, director, and, and the change was strong and tough for them. And, um, and the, the, we are now, after two years, uh, questioning ourselves, what is the purpose of this company? We're going to speak about this in June. And uh, there is a big shift in this. Uh, but also what, what I would like to share is we are doing this now two years. And in the beginning, we had a strong um, acceleration of wellness and, and uh, everything, uh, efficiency in the, the work and everything. But after this fast acceleration, you have a long, 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 long line, which is quite, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, called the faux plat in French. I know it's flat, the flat, uh, but going a bit up, it's quite boring and long. And you, a lot of people are trying to sabotage themselves and the company in that moment. And this is uh, quite important to, to, to continue because I think you can reach a point in which everybody finds his intention. And if you, f you meet the purpose of the company with the people's intention, then it's big, big power. Uh, so this is, uh, I can share this. And about the, the, the fact of uh, uh, you can have a people which uh, who doesn't want to uh, act, they, they need the uh, orders. Um, one important thing is that if you want to live organic, because what we are doing is a bit like a permaculture, you know, you want to reproduce nature, but we are trying to make it. So uh, we have to understand how it works. And it's, it's a qu quite hard job. But in this, uh, every um, cell of the, 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 the company, the group, the, the people who wants to, to use this kind of governance, they need to be able to tell who they are um, in a way really frank, but not violent. So one of the big steps is we, we had a long, uh, uh, and this is not finished, uh, learning about uh, nonviolent communication. And this is quite important because every tension that you feel with someone or with the organization, there is missing, there is a lack, this is not made in, in a good way. Uh, this is a tension, and you need to be able to express it in a way which will be able to produce something, to, to bring the, the wealth and, and thrill. So, uh, Thank you. well, there are many stuff to say about that. It's okay. <laughs> so I don't know if, if sorry. No, just to say if you, uh, I, I can, on a specific question, uh, if you want to. Uh, Thank you. I can answer it. Okay, thanks. So do you want to share your experience regarding um, I think there was something very important is that when it's a self-organized, self-managed organization, um, there is tension, it's human, and also I, I think it leads to um, implying, implying, including people in decision making. So I, I read there was a question about this. How do you make decisions actually, and how do you stay agile? Does anyone want to answer? We have weekly um, tactical and governance meetings. So in the tactical, uh, we discuss how we proceed with our projects, how we work together with our clients. Um, and on the governance meeting, we just um, discuss how we work together uh, in each and every circle. Holacracy organizes the organization in different circles, uh, which don't overlap, but uh, people can be in several circles at the same time. And each circle has uh, it's independent way of self-governance. Thank you. Um, we are in the process right now, so it's really uh, sharing um, ongoing work. Um, what was really important for us was not to take a concept from somewhere else, from another company or just theory, and try to apply it and change our organization to fit into the model but really to, see, to be very pragmatic and for everyone to... Because some people don't feel at ease at all, as it was said. So for us, it was really taking the time to be pragmatic, to really understand which are the questions right now uh, where this governance model is going to bring answers to get to our impact, really connect it back to our impact and our activity and not make it as a isolated discussion for the beauty of it. 
And uh, it was also take the time to build it ourselves. So it takes a long time and usually longer than expected, but we think it's key for the people that want to be part of it and that have expressed those tension to be part of how we're going to create that and maybe taking a bit of inspiration from different parts and then being uh, feel okay to implement it and go for it. And what you said I think is very important is to remind again and again that it's a process, that we are a living organization and it's not because we choose something after a decision process that is going to be fixed and not change forever, but that listening to our tensions and to how it works, we're going to make it improve over time. So these are some of the things we've learned. So it makes it a bit longer than expected, but really making sure it's um, pragmatic and that we are all into the building of it before applying it to ourselves. Okay, um, two things. First, I didn't mention that what Cocoon Project does, which is helping other companies and individuals to improve the way uh, they can carry out meaningful conversation, they can co-create, and they can collaborate in an agile way. So we help them evolve in that respect. Um, um, we we didn't we I, I totally agree we didn't we weren't looking for a, a system uh, you know a technical set of processes of stuff. One of the tenant of organizational design is that you organize according to your goals. It's not the other way around. You choose a fancy liquid organization or organic model because it's fancy, but it depends. It's not good for all the organization. This is important to be said. If I want to send people to Mars, I would not choose uh, a uh, dynamic organizational model. On the other hand, the new discipline of adaptive organization design is fairly new. It's like something that has less than 10 years. So there's a lot to learn. What, what I, th I think is very important, well, uh, regarding decision making, we have a different set of tools. Our model is not pres prescriptive, so we go from dot voting to Lego serious play to a set of intermediate processes like Quest. We don't have specific times established for de decisions. They come out in the flow of activities, and that's where we take it, and everyone is allowed to take decision with us. It's based on four pillars. One is operational reputation. So that means people usually tend not to go into things where they think they cannot add value. And people are pretty smart. They understand where they can add value. And if they fail sometimes, that's cool. I mean, that's what managers do all the time anyway, no? All right, so in that way, it's much more visible. They can choose where to take part. Either they add value or they learn something. Both things are very good. So that's how we work. But I think this set of models, which we can name a lot from Valve Software or even Visa before that or Morningstar, we've, we've seen a lot. We've been speaking with Lumio, with uh, Anspiral, a lot of people. There's one very important thing going on here. It's a shift in the way we perceive and want to live work. This is the core of it. We are shifting from uh, an ego-based ego structure that was designed in the last century from Taylor to the whole management body of knowledge where individuals were the core, the structure were, was based uh, uh, around command and control and people had to adapt to that. We are completely, this is a Copernican revolution, completely shifting the other way around. No matter what model you choose, we're stating that it's the model that has to adapt to people. And back to the goal, what we wanted for Cocoon is to be a platform for the growth of people in the scope of work. So that was the goal. And that is why we've chosen such a model. And that is also why it's so difficult to enter, even though we don't have interviews, the learning curve is so steep. And people say, wow, I've never learned so much since when, I, as, as, since when I entered this company, but it's also so challenging, it's tiring. So that's also a big challenge. You grow a lot, you learn, you can go and experience yourself in whatever you want. It's not ego-based, it's based on the ecosystem. So if a, if a person fails, it's good as long as that gives feedback loop to the others. But it's tiring. It's much more simple to work in a structured environment. This needs to be said because you have to understand what are your goals and then you choose. If you want to go for growth, growth costs fatigue. 
for everybody. That's a natural law. You want to grow, you have to face a little effort-driven process, all right? If you, if you want efficiency, on the other side, simple things, a more structured model might be a good idea. Holacracy, for example, in my own opinion, stands in between. It's, it's hierarchical, it's structured, but it allows this structure to change dynamically. So it's not properly organical, but it's not fixed, so it can evolve. And that's a good halfway model. It depends on the goal, this is very important to say. So culture, you really are prepared to lose control over your organization and make it adapt to people inside your organization, organization and people outside the organization. So listening and continuously changing, we don't know what other people will do. Maybe they will change the governance model of our own company in the future. Maybe it will not be our own company anymore. So it's a tricky. Are you, are you ready for that? If that's the case, what I can assure for all the people we'll be speaking all around the world is that the way work is lived in such an organism is completely brand new. People are happy to go at work, to contribute, to fail, to, to have discussions. It's a completely different mindset, but it's not possibly the most simple and efficient way to go. Uh, I think it's really important what uh, has been mentioned here is that okay, you're going to pick your methods, approaches, but you have to adapt them to your organization to really support your purpose. For us, these are lean, agile, holacracy, and co-ownership, but um, you will pick your rounds and let's adapt them. Yeah, I think that those are some... Yeah, we have a question back there. Yeah, there are one question, but mm -hmm. please uh, think about the conclusion because uh, it's almost finished. And you can continue the debate outside, maybe. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Um, I have a question around, like, what do you think about a relationship between hiring and firing? So what I hear so far is that you have an open hiring, that anybody can join, anybody can leave. But do you see that as being, like, a, a component of being this kind of an organization? Or it can still apply a very elitist kind of standard? Like, how do you see relations? Thanks. Can you repeat the last part of the sentence? That was a bit fast. <laughs> Um, like, do you see having an open, dynamic organization where anyone can join um, and, you know, no firing type of standard being part of the organization, um, or that doesn't really matter? You could also apply Google-ish or McKinsey type of very eliting, elite type of hiring standard. Yeah. Well, so um, maybe I can say something about that, because um, I think it really depends. In the case of WeShare, that's really a question we think about a lot, because since we're a community and you know, our culture and really the feeling that we're like one big family is really important. It's not something that people leave and they can't get kicked out. So basically, um, the way it's sort of emerging is that we have projects and we have project leaders and they recruit their team, they build it together based on how they would like to design it and they basically have the freedom to do it however they like. So they can actually choose a specific governance for that project, like the WeShareFest for instance, for that team. And so people can get kicked out of a team. If they don't do well, well then, you know, it just maybe doesn't work out. They should do something else. But they don't get, they don't leave WeShare. Like, it's a community, so they're always part of that. And in that case, of course, that definitely, I think, brings some, you know, challenges because things don't always work out. And it's definitely, it's a hard thing to really implement. I'm sure uh, Marianne also uh, can say something about that. Yeah, sure. Um, actually, I think we need to. I, I really, actually, it's really important for me that we do this checkout. So maybe I'm sorry, I'm not going to to reply to this to this question. Um, so as a checkout, as a conclusion, what I would like to say is what I I, I just remember what the biggest uh, factor uh, came out of this discussion is I think it's engagement. And I saw many of you ask this question: How do you keep people committed, engaged? And I think it's also related to what you just said. And it's the sense of belonging to something that is bigger to us, uh, from, uh, from us, sorry. And that's, that also makes that people who doesn't think, uh, think they fit in the culture or in this way of thinking, they will naturally go. Because they don't, they don't feel. Short. I think we are talking about the static mindset, the problem of the educational culture. 
Um, there is new companies who want to, to go for, for this direction, the open organization. It's easy because everyone is going in the same direction, everyone is willing to go in the same direction. But when you have a company with an historic, uh, direct, uh, just a classical way of thinking, it's very difficult. We can be patient, it can take one, one year, two years to stay, trying to change people, trying to change their mind, going in the right direction, but at one moment, when you feel that people will never go in this direction because it's not their culture, what they want, how you do. And you are stuck because you are in a self-managed organization, you don't want to fire people, they are not li uh, living naturally, and that's the problem and the big challenge today. I read about companies who are offering a big amount of money for people to go, so that's always way to do it. Okay, maybe just one word to conclude? We do fire. Yeah, I mean the checkout. <laughs> so, the, so the checkout will be as we did it at the beginning. How do you feel now? And with just one word, actually. Because one word is hard. I feel like uh, we need more, <laughs> more time, more discussion. So let's continue after. I'm super excited to see how many organizations think about these new models. Um, I think we're all experimenting here, and, um, and I'm going back with even more questions. <laughs> Me too. Um, just, just one short thing. I always hear to speak of people speaking about digital transformation. I was mentioning yesterday. I believe you are completely in front of a completely different thing, which is a people-centered transformation, as I said. And so it's not that you have to adapt to adopt a tool, it's that you have to understand what's the best way for your people to work in. And there are ways to evolve that as well without creating uh, use, useless tension. So that's what we do all the time. I mean, that's what I love to do, is helping people to work better. And maybe one day they will be liquid, maybe not, who cares? Um, I just would like to underline one trend which, which I realized is that um, Collaborative governments, or call it however you want, uh, isn't just um, like um, under the hood trend of uh, hippies, but organizations uh, with serious uh, clients, budgets, teams uh, are turning towards these kind of models. Uh, and I think this is a really important shift uh, because now it's possible to spread that kind of uh, value system all around uh, different industries. Thanks all of you.